Anyway, I got places to be, a face to fix, and oh, bad guys to kill. The Viaduct sequence was one of the original pieces that was done for the test footage. And really, the reason why it was done was to illustrate a different kind of filmmaking. When I first threw that idea out there to Fox, which was, hey, we can make a big budget feeling superhero movie by this methodology, they said, oh, really, show us. It's easier to convince clients when you have something that looks really great. So basically, it's a really good looking previs, and we have like final mocap with all the stunts and all the acting from all the actors. We shoot a lot of cameras, edit it together, put some sound effects, music, temp, of course. But basically, once this comes out of our department, you can already see whether or not it's going to work. That original sequence I did with Tim three and a half years ago, I coordinated that sequence in did the performance capture for Deadpool in that. We actually got to have Ryan do all the acting part. Excusez, a poor chaval. Ow, 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 When we did ow. it, it wasn't all that common to do fully CG shots. Now, it's not so special. They do it all the time because of the rate that visual effects is advancing. Yeah, Test footage was such a tone setter, and it really did allow us to understand what we were trying to do. I only have 12 bullets. So you're gonna have to share. Let's count them down. This sequence was called 16 bullets, but due to budgetary constraints, it's now 12 bullets. There's a frequent jest on set that it's gonna be one bullet before we're done, but no. In your typical superhero film, the superhero is always prepared. He's a good guy, he thinks ahead of everybody else, he's smarter, faster, better. But in Deadpool's case, that's not always true. Ah, shit! I forgot my ammo bag! The fact that he has to make do with 12 is the whole structure of this fight. He's trained to kill people and not be killed, but now he's got this unique thing to him where he regenerates, he can't die. So it's kind of like all bets are off. It's kind of spliced and fractured throughout the film. So we, we begin on it and then we come back to it later and then we come back to it again. So we need a lot of meat on the bone to get a piece like that done. 12 Bullets was a really cool sequence. That was another one we ended up previsiting out and doing that here at Blur. The previs has been an incredible tool. Tim's sequences are what ended up getting the movie made. And so it was just amazing to sort of have this incredibly high quality reference material that we were able to use as a guide as we were sort of making the film. Tim is a big visual person. He's a performance capture director. So what he'll do is he'll go into the volume and we'll do all our previs full on with performance, not animatics, but actual performance doing it. So he has a realistic interpretation of what he's gonna do here on the day. You go and you do mocap, and it's really theater in the round. I'm just worried that people are moving correctly in relation to each other, that the timing is right, that it's natural in the way they get from point A to point B. The opening title sequence was kind of like the starting point of the whole previous process. We knew early on that there was going to be this opening title sequence, which was basically this frozen moment of the car sort of like tumbling. Right off the bat, the audience is in the world of Deadpool, pulling through the spinning SUV and experiencing Deadpool's thoughts on who's working on this film <laughs> and how it's being done. We basically focused on figuring out how the characters were going to be and what that frozen moment was before we started doing previs for the whole car chase. This way, once we started the car chase, we could actually make sure that once the car starts tumbling, we end up with exactly the same pose. The teaser piece we did was all CG. This is gonna be a mix, probably mostly live action. I love practical shooting. I mean, nobody likes a green screen, it's awful. So we've done as much practical as we possibly can. To make the freeway sequence, we had to shut down the biggest artery of the biggest freeway in Vancouver. It's actually the bridge that leads from essentially the suburbs into the city. And they gave it to us for a few hours of the day where they would shut down one whole side of it. I think for a while I was public enemy number one because they didn't say Deadpool shut down traffic, they just said Ryan Reynolds has shut down traffic in, in Vancouver, which sort of sucked for me. We wanted it to feel interactive. We wanted it to feel like they were in a real location and not just in a stage. There is something about interacting with the sunlight, with real air. I don't think you can ever completely fake. This sequence requires a lot of timing, a lot of rehearsal, 30 stunt personnel. So that on top of the other crew that's required for this sequence, special effects, explosion, visual effects. I think we were there for at least two and a half weeks just shooting that one particular action sequence in three separate parts. Trying to execute those sequences in the time frame that we have has been very difficult. 
because we're only here from 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. and we have to be off this, this viaduct by 3 p.m. Usually when you're making the movie, even if you're on location, you can leave some things standing on that set. If we left things standing on that set, they'd get run over by a truck. Wrap it up, guys. Wrap it up. Good work today, good hustle. We had to have a prep strategy so that when we wrap out, we can execute our wrap out within a 15 minute time frame. And getting all of this stuff wrapped out in 15 minutes takes quite a bit of planning. We've tied in with what Tim's done for the previs, which mapped out all the action for us. So we follow those beats, which include bullet hits in the cars and body hits, blood hits on stunt guys, and the infrastructure for water for wet down, and a lot of smoking cars. When we do a bullet hit, it's a small explosive with a blood bag that we put underneath the wardrobe, and then we cut the wardrobe a little bit so it comes through. And we have a firing system attached to that explosive. And I watch the stunt guy's action and time out his action so it all works together. Three, two, stupid! Worth it. Right now, it's, in the previous, he's sliding, right. but we're going to have I'll tell you in a minute. It's bouncing it's hit. It's bouncing hit, yeah. The previous required extensive, highly trained acrobatic movement plus martial arts skills from our Deadpool Devils. Fortunately, I was able to find two of them that filled that role, so we can interchange them as needed. Alex and Adrian are two guys that have been there from the beginning and really learned the character and understood how he walks and moves, and they're incredible. Alex is a guy that just basically defies gravity in every way. He can do things that I just didn't think were humanly possible. Ryan is doing quite a bit of stunt work in the sequence. He's doing a lot of the physical comedy that goes along with the sequence as well, so that's all him. We only bring in our double for a few things that might be outside of his training. Hopefully the audience won't be able to tell when there's a double or not. I said, you guys have to watch Watch him, how he moves, how he acts, and incorporate that into your physicality. So in between the acting beats, you can incorporate that type of movement with the action sequences so that we'll make it as seamless as possible. Three, two, one, go! And cut. These camera, we can just we can shoulder here. No, I think we, we I think we take that slider again and go. Yep. Whack, whack. When we shot the freeway sequence, it was really important to us to keep the cameras moving in these super dynamic ways. And one of the ways that we achieved that was through long steady cam moves, handheld shots, using a motorcycle to chase other motorcycles through the space. And we really wanted to create this sort of frenzy, especially when all of the pedestrians are running away away from this chaos that was happening. Okay, this thing's ready. Capturing it the right way with our camera bike took a lot of planning because of the weaving in and out of these very tight vehicles took a very skilled rider. There's this genius motorcycle stunt rider named Regis that we brought up from New Orleans who's phenomenal on a bike and could keep up with anybody. So he was able to chase our stunt bike riders on this motorcycle rig where we were able to get super, super close to the motorcycle and move through heavily congested areas at high speeds. What we have with the cycle cam, it's a one of a kind vehicle. It's the first and only of its kind right now in the business. The bike is actually 100% electric, so there's no motor vibration. It offers a very smooth and stable ride. We shot that motorcycle sequence on a stabilized head, so no matter how bumpy the roads get, no matter what happens to the bike itself, the camera has this sort of fluid, precise movement to it. I had rehearsed with them a couple days before so that they can get their timing in sync so that we're making sure that all the action is tied in with Deadpool's movement because there's running and chasing with the motorcycle as well as firing and throwing of katanas. We're chasing a motorcycle, we're pushing a motorcycle through traffic, we're even tracking with Deadpool himself as he's running and firing guns. The motorcycle itself is the ZF nine, but to make it camera worthy, we put a lot of external components on it and a lot of R&D in it. This is far from riding a normal motorcycle with upwards of 80 to 100 pounds on the rear end and camera and then offset with another 60 or so pounds in batteries. It's a very big vehicle to control. <sighs> now, if I were a 200 pound sack of assholes named Francis, where would I hide? There's a bunch of phantom shots in the film where we're utilizing a 4K camera that can shoot up to 1,800 frames a second. So for instance, there's shots of the motorcycle tires peeling out. We have some super slow motion shots of bullets being pushed out of the weapon, muzzle flashes, things like that. 
In shooting this film, we've done a lot of the stunts practically, and we're trying to get as much action on camera as possible. But because of our limited schedule, we're having to do certain things digitally. There are certainly visual effects elements. I mean, that's Tim's bread and butter. The freeway sequence is an all digital environment and has so much complexity to it and so much going on. Finding locations to film the opening freeway chase became too difficult. So it was determined that the most efficient way to do that sequence would be to move in a fully CG direction. It starts out with animating and just getting all of our cameras working and get that animated together and really feeling the cinematic punctuations of those shots. We shift in and out of frozen moments and slow motion and normal speed and we're kind of ramping in and out of that. We photographed all of those cars. We scanned them with a process called LiDAR. We took hundreds of reference photos, interiors and exteriors, so that they could be rebuilt by our vendor, Atomic Fiction, meticulously. We did these simulations where we sit and we watch and we see how a tire would shred when the tire hits or if we pop the hood and let the engine fly out, what would happen and what pieces would rip off and how the glass would break. And those are the kind of the geeky fun things we get to do as visual effects guys. <laughs> We did shoot the thugs and Deadpool's character in an actual SUV that was dismantled door by door as necessary over green screen so that the actors' performances were live action. The tricky part happens in post when the CG environments that are spinning by outside that car needed to be developed to match into the live action portion. Coming from VFX, I'm very comfortable with completely computer generated characters. And so I have no problem with mixing back and forth. When you see someone getting thrown across a large space, oftentimes it'll be a digital double. So what we do is we go in and we scan all of our key players and do these full high tech 3D body scans so we can create them as digital doubles and have them move through spaces. As he counts down his 12 remaining bullets looking for the Ajax character, we begin in by flipping him out of his SUV using CG elements. Those are actually CG Deadpools who jump out. Due to the time limitations on that viaduct, we did not have a good amount of time to rig for the stunt work that would be needed to get the height needed and the very specific arm positioning for the first bullet, bullet number 12, to come out of the chamber. So it was captured on a mocap stage, and then the mocap data was applied to the CG model. I think the reason it feels so seamless is because one of the many things that Tim Miller does so well is understand the grammar of visual effects. So he knows where the audience's brain will just go with and trust something that is fake without recognizing that it's fake. It's really kind of a beautiful blend of partnerships between different departments so that no one will be able to tell what is CG and what is not.